Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming again to the what session is it? The fourth session? Fourth session? Something like that. Um, so, like I said yesterday, today is a very um, focused and selfish theme of turntable music, and it it's, uh, reflects my interest as a, as a turntable musician. And um, so I'll, I'll be talking about some um, general history and approaches, and then leading on to try to branch it off, not to just keep it into sort of turntable music, but see, well, what are the implications, uh, implications to larger, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the larger context of electronic music or computer music, how, what are some of the things that we could bring back um, in terms of <coughs> interface design or uh, practice of electronic music? Um, uh, so I'll be presenting first, and then after this, uh, Chappelle uh, Hansen will present um, uh, more specifically about Scratch and Scratch music and sort of the analysis of it. So my, my presentation today is based on a paper that I wrote in 2006 called uh, Turntable Music in the Digital Era. And um, first, I guess I want to ask, just kind of roughly define what turntable music is, and actually the wording turntable music comes from Chattel's paper when I was doing research about some sort of um, writing about uh, this practice that involves not just hip-hop turntablism or not just DJing and not just experimental turntablism, which is kind of written in each, each, each of the genres are, are sort of written, but there isn't kind of an encompassing uh, term for uh, discourse about it. So what is turntable music? In a now definition, I guess it's um, a musical practice that's focused on the instrumental usage of turntable mixer. And of course, I'm doubling the word, the meaning of instrumental with also kind of significance and importance. A broad definition, I guess, is a musical practice based upon skillful playback of recorded media or just something that involves a, a rotating interface or something that spins. Um, I guess we could broaden it that much to uh, <laughs> Uh, to just get um, more people interested in this. Um, so th those are sort of, th these are very rough definitions. Um, and it also gets kind of complicated when you start getting into digital technology and uh, interfaces where uh, these days where vinyl becomes a bit irrelevant in some way. So the evolution of the phonographic technology, um, the sort of the, the, the initial um, device was the phonograph, and uh, recently they discovered a recording of I think 200, uh, yeah, almost 200 years old, of um, which was the earliest uh, recording of a voice, um, and it was sort of a it was a device that you talk into a cone and uh, it tran transduces the vibration onto a, a stylus and it kind of writes down the the the, the waveform of your voice. Um, it wasn't really for um, playing back the sound, but it was more for um, um, leaving the, the trace of your voice. And what's interesting, um, Jonathan Stern uh, has this great book called The um, Audible Past, and he talks about how the actual device uses the, the, a human membrane. So it, it kind of coincides with um, this um, development of technology at the turn of the century where um, you know, the autonomy of the body and the organs um, was was achieved was was thought of so if you want to think about the ear you actually look at the human ear and you dissect it and then put it into a device and try to mechanically reproduce the hearing function of the human um, so anyways that so that 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 the phonograph was sort of the early device and then it later develops into the the phonograph and Edison released the Edison phonograph in uh, 1877 there were sort of other experiments and um, Prototype before that, but he was the first one to kind of commercialize it and, you know, uh, release it as this, um, um, a, as a product in a way. Um, then it was still on a cylinder, a wax cylinder. Um, and um, what was interesting back then is that it was both a recording device and a playback device. So you talk into a cone, and it, it writes on this wax cylinder, and you could play it back, which isn't a function of a turntable uh, today. Uh, that develops with the Berliner gramophone, which was developed in 1892. 
which they don't use the wax cones anymore, but more a, a plate, so like the record it is now. And so that's, the, the Berliner gramophone is sort of what kind of solidified the form and the development. Um, jumping ahead a little bit more, if you look into more of the, um, the musical um, the, uh, importance, the instrumental importance of the turntable, there was the Califone portable record players. It's a company from the US where they made these portable, portable turntables which had a built-in amp and something you could carry around. Before that, you know, the, the phonograph was something you had, it's like a home stereo system, uh, which is kind of big, and, or you had to plug it into a sound system, but the California ones were portable, so a lot of musicians or DJs kind of brought it with them, and so Christian Markley was somebody who uh, used these to play like gigs. And then the Technics Direct Drive turntable came out and started in the 70s, and this is what really supported and um, boosted the DJ culture. So the direct drive technology is turntables, the way they spin, before the direct drive you had a belt. So you had a little motor with a belt running around it to, to run the bigger platter. Uh, with the direct drive you actually have a motor, a really powerful motor, spinning the platter itself. Uh, you need a lot of energy, but uh, Technics um, uh, developed a, a sort of an integrated circuit that had a, you know, um, quartz clock to uh, maintain the speed and a very high torque to move the, um, the platter. So in uh, result, it became a great interface for turntablists. You know, it gave it a really, you could really kind of uh, manipulate the platter. And um, uh, you know, it, it, it really kind of solidified it as um, the instrument it is today. So if we look at the instrumental use of the phonograph, so not just to play back um, music for your own, I don't know, for, to listen to music, but sort of to play for somebody, sort of a performative aspect of it. Uh, we could look at certain things, you, you know, when the Berliner uh, phonograph came out, it was also this huge marketing uh, commercial kind of um, scheme. And so one of the ideas they promoted as these home concerts, um, that you bring the orchestra or the, the quartet or the, you know, the music to your home. And they, they promoted it with these ads with pictures of the, you know, the father coming home with the phone playing in front of the family. And everybody sits around the fireplace and listens to the music. Um, of course, this kind of image sort of dies down more with the, uh, the radio comes uh, becomes more popular. But it sort of um, introduces this idea of playing music for other people, kind of what, you know, the basis of what DJing is, is that you're kind of, you're choosing and selecting music uh, not just for your own purpose, but for the people there, or for the atmosphere, or for the context. So in a way, that's sort of the beginning of the act of playing back music as a, as a performance, almost. Of course, there's Cage's Imaginary Landscapes in 1939, which um, one of the early compositions that there's a turntable performer in it manipulating the test tone record. Um, Schaefer, Pierre Schaefer, um, with the music concrete, he actually started experimenting with the turntable before he moved to the, uh, the tapes, the magnetic tapes. Um, he, he thought the, the vinyl was too limiting um, in terms of source material and stuff. Um, it's kind of a pity because he would have been much more hip if he continued with the turntables. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then there's the Bronx DJs of Grandmaster Flash and Grandmaster Theodore who, um, you know, made the uh, foundation for hip hop music. And Christian Markley in the late 70s. Uh, Herbie Hancock had this song called Rocket, which was a huge commercial hit. And in there, Grandmaster uh, DXT starts with this waka waka sound. And that was you know, broadcast all over the world. And it really inspired uh, this whole new generation of uh, kids who you know, saw the turntable as an instrument. And they really um, you know, took this. And one of the one of the groups that were really inspired were the um, the mostly Asian American kids in California and LA and San Francisco, uh, and they developed this whole um, style of turntablism, um, which is kind of um, really focused on the on the manipulation of the platter and the record and the mixer. So um, just to kind of introduce some of the basic. Um, the practices of turntable music. It's things that you probably know. There's the DJ, 
Um, it looks more like this, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you want to look like that. <laughs> you you kind of end up there. Um, there's the, um, the, the battle scene. That's actually DJ Cuber, who's one of the masters at scratching. Uh, and this is his um, do-it-yourself scratch video. Um, so these pauses is for you to um, you know, copy his skills, to battle his skills. And he has a whole series where he's dressed up differently and all that. But um, so hip hop turntable is this um, you know, really kind of die-hard um, uh, kind of desire to master the manipulation and to um, achieve virtuosity and speed and, and how fast you could cut the fader or the scratch. But what's interesting is that it's a, it's a pretty communal thing. You have these groups there. There's an idea of sharing a lot there where they, they get together and they share their skills or you know, they um, release these videos that are traded um, and everybody kind of learns that on, since the internet, there's all these online communities where they're talking about techniques and um, you know, how to how to practice you know, stuff. And then, so that's the second practice, and then there's um, experimental temptation. So. So that's sort of the, the more, the turntable music, which is more uh, about sound, I guess, or improvisation. Um, and um, so those are the sort of the three kind of pillars you have. And there's, of course, there's everything in between. Um, not everybody's going to smash their record um, during their performance. But so if you look at the instrumental evolution of the turntable, you know, how has it become, how is it developed as not just a playback device, but as an instrument to uh, perform with? Um, so there's a lot of experimentation by artists themselves. Um, the triphonic turntable by Yannick Schaefer is a turntable with three arms um, that he built to play um, yeah, different parts of, uh, from one record. Uh, Walter, Walter Kitundu is a San Francisco-based artist. Um, uh, he's been making uh, these turntable instruments that are all kind of based on um, amplifying um, the needle. So the, the, the record needle is, is essentially just a pickup. So everything it touches, um, it works as a, as a contact mic. Um, so he made these string instruments that when you have the needle down, you could also play through, um, uh, through the, the stylus itself. Um, he has tons and tons of these kind of beautiful instruments that he makes, and he actually put, put forms of them as well. Uh, the Scratchophone is by the guy, in, um, I think in Montreal. So his idea was that, well, the turntable itself should kind of become like a djembe or a drum instrument. And um, what's also interesting is that he's kind of pushing ahead this business model of everything being self-built and self-developed. So he's not, he doesn't really have a technical background, but he's been working for at least the last four years, um, making everything himself. And um, I guess that's the, the latest version. So I don't know if that's him, but you, know, you could play in the park on a beautiful autumn day. Um, and then in the commercial um, area too, there have been few products where you know 
DJs and turntablists have worked together with the with the manufacturers. So the Vestax Kirfo, something that Qbert um, worked with, and it's a basically a DJ mixer and a turntable put together. So you have a crossfader, um, and uh, it's like an all-in-one unit. The Vestax Controller One is has all these buttons that um, can um, change the pitch or the rotate the rotation speed of the platter, and you could program it so. You could assign, if you have a, a, a sine wave um, record, you could assign it to be an, uh, at a scale you want or uh, you know whatever octaves you want to uh, transpose it. So it's kind of moving the turntable more into like a keyboard sort of instrument. Um, and then DJ mixers is the other very important um, aspect. And um, so you have these battle mixers or um, yeah, mixers specifically for DJing, which have certain qualities. Um, the faders are very smooth and um, uh, very responsive, or the filtering is, is very unique or specialized to what the DJs need. Um, so these, these DJ mixers are, you know, are, are extremely specialized, and you know, they're not cheap, but they're very durable and um, you know, good interfaces. Also, the, the status itself is um, has developed so something like the Ortofon uh, Qbert model has extremely high output um, for record needle and it's also designed to take a lot of um, um, just um, the the force from the side so when you scratch it a lot it it, it doesn't skip basically um, and just from the, I mean, these, these are my work of um, trying to build my own needles, and this is also based upon a lot of people's work in the experimental turntablism field of looking at the stylus as essentially as a, as a piezo or a pickup. And um, so uh, Kitundu's work earlier too is based on this, that you know, if you just um, attach a piezo element um, and have wires to it, you could amplify the sound of the wires. So there's also that sort of experimentation going on as well. So that's that's all sort of the, the analog, more or less the analog realm. Um, and what I'm interested in is sort of, well, how does digital technology come into this and how can we use um, this new technology to do better stuff or cooler stuff? And even not, uh, even in sort of the more commercial areas, uh, DJing as well, it's, it's kind of taking over. Practice. So, sort of parallel, before the DJs um, sort of got into the digital stuff, there was experiments with CD players when they came out in the 80s. And people like uh, Yasuna Tone or Ovo or Nick Collins started hacking uh, CD players and trying to find well, what's, uh, what, what they could do um, interesting stuff uh, with, with that. So here's a video of Nick Collins. <laughs> switches that connect to the CD player and it, it kind of it stutters the, the CD player is stuttering kind of, kind of in like sort of short loop and then when he makes contact it moves a little bit you could stutter it and it's 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 interesting because you know the CD player you can't really scratch it like a, like a vinyl it's the same rotating um, platter but it doesn't work the same way so one of the um, interesting artifacts which for the turntable was scratching right you know by stopping the, the record and then pulling it back, you get this sound. With the CD player, it, it becomes a stuttering um, sound. Um, the late, mid to late 90s, um, manufacturers started building uh, CD turntables, uh, which back in the days were sort of huge. And they also had a function, a nice function where when you, when you pause the track, it would stay in this like really short loop, so you get this stuttering sound. And uh, a lot of DJs actually liked that sound and, and used it. Um, 
then it sort of developed into more of the advanced contemporary stuff where the CDJ-1000 series was the first CD turntable that you could scratch. So it's actually an emulation of the vinyl, which was um, you know, great for um, DJs and turntablists because for them, it was bridging the two worlds and it had a simulate, it, it, it simulated the, the record player. You can now do the same kind of sound with it. Um, so, you know, it kind of evolves into this where it's a CD player with a vinyl interface. You can't play the vinyl, but it, the vinyl part is just the interface. Um, so it's the ultimate kind of tactile feel of the turntable, um, but playing digital media. Um, so today what's happening is that, you know, digital DJing is, is really taking over and, and how it works is that you have a, a DJing software um, like uh, Serato or Factor Scratch. There's a whole different um, variety of packages. <laughs> and then you have a control interface. Um, one of them is um, uh, the digital vinyl system, which you have time-coded vinyl, and you play that uh, into your sound card, and the computer <laughs> analyzes the, the time-coded uh, signal and um, there's a, a pitch tracking, so when you move it, um, you, know, you know when it's moving faster or slower, and you control um, digital files through that. Um, I could quickly show you what some of these DJ um, software packages look like. Uh, this is Tractor. Um, so this is just... Um, a, a DJ software which you have two decks or you could have four <coughs> decks. You could play it from your laptop but you could also connect it to a digital vinyl or some any kind of MIDI controller <coughs> and you would just kind of drag you know you could assign all these to keys and you could drag it and then <coughs> you know it, it simulates the vinyl so <coughs> So yeah, you have these these um, these softwares, and then you could use you could either use the time coded vinyl or you also have these controllers that are being released. Um, so this is one of the Vestax controllers. Um, this actually is a sound card built in um, with these rotary um, controllers, and it comes with its own software. Um, and it has sort of DJ faders and stuff. And it's, it's a nice controller. Um, uh, I think it's 14-bit MIDI resolution. And you also have sort of these, this kind of, um, this is just a MIDI controller with a, with a an, again, a, a rotating circular interface. Um, you guys are welcome to play around with this stuff. Uh, I have, a, I have, like, I have a, a DJ battle mixer too come up later on to feel how you know, smooth these faders are built or how you know sturdy it's made. <coughs> so here's some more examples of the interface that are now and I think really the, the industry will be focusing much more on these um, control interfaces um, for um, yeah controlling these uh, DJ softwares. Also, mixers are evolving. Uh, the Quark 04 is an integrated audio MIDI uh, mixer where every, every not, it's an audio mixer, but it has a built in Firewire interface, audio interface, and every knob is assignable to MIDI or the audio, uh, controlling the audio. So, whether it's green or red tells you if it's controlling the audio signal or if it's sending MIDI to um, your computer. Also, again, this stuff will be. Um, you'll see much more products which are sort of integrated mixers um, that both control audio or um, control data. So most of this commercial stuff, what they focus, is, focus on is the simulation of the vinyl and the traditional DJ setup. Um, that's their main goal. And I think uh, at this point it's come pretty close 
to the fact that everybody can play digital files like they were able to play vinyl before. And you know, no vinyl and playing digital file means you know lighter bags, which is great. DJs always have shoulder problems, and um, it also it doesn't you have a much wider selection of um, songs that you could choose from when you're DJing. You know, it's it's you put it all in your hard drive and you have you know um, two years worth of music that you can play in a one hour set. But so for me the question is well. You know, all this simulation stuff is great, and it's, it's great for DJs, but, you know, what about, you know, extending or augmenting or looking for new expression um, with the turntable uh, through this new technology? You know, where, where does that fit in? And it's, it's sort of, well, for DJs who want to play in clubs, you know, their goal is to, is is more about the selecting or the mixing or the certain EQs that they do in clubs. So the digital system sort of fulfills this. You know, they're they're quite content. And if I wanted to DJ, you know, I would go I, I would go for these digital systems. It's it's not really about so much self-expression in a performance sense, but it's about playing music for a certain context or for an audience. So it's great to have a wide selection. It's great not to have to carry your records. For hip hop turntablism. Um, you know, they follow these really rigid kind of morals, these values towards skill and, um, and practice. And there's a good example, Vestax released this mixer called the Samurai series, and it actually had a function on the crossfader that would cut the fader double or three times more than he did. So without much practice, you could do these amazing skills, and it totally got um, bashed on the internet, and it didn't sell. It, go, it went against the morals of these battle DJs. It was cheating. Um, so they didn't really accept this too much. And it's, it's also sort of, yeah, in a way, it, it's cheating for them. It's, it's, you know, you're using technology to, 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 yeah, make a shortcut. And I mean, if you leave it to the manufacturers, they're going to force something like this on you. <laughs> Which, um, I wouldn't want to play. So I, I guess it really lies, you know, the, this kind of expression or, you know, experimentation leaves more to the, um, the experimental turntablists, people who work in the realm of, you know, improvised music or experimental music. It's, it's these artists who are interested in new sounds or new ways to perform. And um, they're the ones who should embrace this new technology and sort of, um, yeah, find what's, what's possible to do with it. Um, so that's sort of kind of my thesis of, 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 of today's presentation and also of what my practice is, is well, how can, as, how can us as artists um, or involved in sort of the creative field design alternative ter tools for a new turntable expression? And um, it's something that I do feel kind of a, a growing atmosphere amongst um, a generation of musicians who grew up watching both hip hop and turntablism, but also um, being interested in improvised music or seeing people like Christian Markley. Um, so one of the things I started with a group of friends is the um, Alternative Turntablists, uh, Alternative Turntable Music Forum, um, which is hopefully kind of develops as a platform for um, the turntable musicians to share about um, you know, ideas and um, ways to implement stuff, um, different setups, introducing different setups. Um, so far, there's not so many people, but, um, you know, sharing projects. Um, let's see. Um, so this is um, Ferret and Berhe making a robot arm. Turntable, which is controlled through Lego. Um, so this is this is uh, you know this is a new development that um, I hope kind of catches on more. Sorry. Have a good day. Um, and for me, I guess it kind of goes back um, to yeah this this guy Grandmaster Flash.
So what, what, what's, what's important about Grandmaster Flash, other than the fact that he's a great DJ, um, was that you know, he had some uh, knowledge in engineering. He, he went to, um, to school to study a little bit about um, audio engineering. And he was um, he went up in the Bronx and he saw all these DJs. Um, uh, he saw Kool Herc playing records, but only playing the breaks, you know, playing a specific part of the record and uh, moving back and forth between the same records with just the specific parts of the records. But he thought there was something missing to it, and he wanted to develop his own style that was different from the guys who were already playing. And what he did was that you know, he used his knowledge in electronics to build sort of a setup and a style. And it, it's, it's really something simple, but the, the cheap DJ mixers that these kids in the Bronx could afford didn't have a headphone um, queuing system. So if you plug in your headphone, you could only listen to the track that was playing, and you couldn't listen to another channel. So he just made a little uh, switcher, audio switcher, that you could listen to the, the record that's not playing. And he, you know, he had the knowledge to open up his mixer and add this. And what it, what happened is that you know he could cue his re his next record up and cut it in at the re exact right moment. And that totally revolutionized the whole practice of hip hop um, and uh, DJing. It, it led to beat juggling and this really quick style of um, cutting back and forth records, you know, on the beat. And so for me, it's a, it's a great inspiration and it's something that's kind of embedded already in this practice of artists themselves kind of opening up the hood based on sort of artistic pursuit or vision and, um, you know, implementing it. And then also what I like about not just implementing it, but because you're an artist and because it's part of your practice, you also uh, make music out of it where you practice to achieve a certain style. Um, so, you know, some projects that kind of explore this new um, uh, possibilities with uh, digital technology with turntable um, music is, for example, the D group, which is a force feed feedback turntable. And basically, it's a it's a platter that has a motor uh, underneath it that could um, give the user different kind of force feedback on the vinyl, so it could give you bumps. And it's it's, it's a prototype that. I don't know if it's still developed or not. But one of the possibilities I, that he mentions, uh, that Tim mentions in his paper, which might be um, very interesting, is that you could actually give um, feedback just through the platter of, for example, the waveform. Um, so you know, when DJs cue and look for the beginning of the, of the beat or look for um, a certain attack, you could just kind of feel it by moving your hand, um, kind of moving through the waveform. Um, for me, my inspiration uh, was when I saw this video of uh, DJ Radar. phrases and then start layering it. Um, for me, this was a, a great kind of inspiration to see well, you know, how a turntable could become a solo instrument. Um, and that kind of led me into the direction of learning how to program and to find solutions um, to achieve this. Um, so I started building my own um, interfaces that had a foot pedal that, um, uh, that could sample and um, also starting to use the computer and learning how to program Max MSP, I started making uh, user interfaces and um, basically seeing, um, kind of like what Alex showed yesterday, how to uh, sample myself, how to extend myself, my voice, which is the turntable, into, um, into a performance. Um, but as you can see with the, um, with the DJ Radar performance, you know, it, it kind of takes time for it to develop, right? You have to sample each phrase at a time. 
and also it was a very kind of it's a very kind of a solo setup. Um, and so by the time I moved to the Netherlands and coming to Stam and also being more interested in improvised music um, and playing with other um, musicians, um, I, I had to think of a new way to sample myself. And um, uh, and I guess speed becomes a crucial thing. Um, I wanted to be able to react very quickly um, to the changes and the, the playing of other people. Um, so, yeah, so this is my, my current setup and my current project. Um, and just to give you a, a quick demo. So I, I made this, this USB box while I was here at Stein. And then um, I wrote a little module in Max MSP called um, Cut and Play. And I can just show you the patch. Yes. So it, it, it's quite simple. Um, it's basically just replacing the, um, the, foot, the foot pedal, which I was using to sample my sound with the crossfader. And um, I have this documented on the, on the forum that I just showed you earlier, too, so you could read more details about it. But this mixer has a, a fader trigger um, signal that every time you move the fader, it sends a, a pulse uh, out from this little plug. So I read that into my computer, and basically what it does, it gives me an on and off of the fader. So that's open, it's closed. And so I, I, I kind of replaced that um, with the foot pedal to um, start sampling and, and um, playing back. So if I have something. time I um, the fader is playing is open so it's playing the sound from the record uh, and I, I move it back um, it should play so it's just recording uh, what I just played and um, it's 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 basically that's it and by um, combining different rhythms and um, deciding when to play and what, um, when not to play. I could kind of build these complex rhythms with it. researching different kind of sensors and um, building different interfaces, but what actually gave me most kind of satisfaction as a performer and um, what also integrated my whole setup and um, as an interface was just um, basically one switch. It was just a one-bit resolution input that was connected to a very crucial part of my setup. And so my performance um, is pretty much centered around this one module. Um, I have I have other um, things that, that, that are added onto it, like effects, or um, I have another sampler that I do trigger with my foot pedal. But most of it kind of boils down to just this uh, sampler that's integrated in the crossfader. Um, so let's see, to just wrap up things. Um, so yeah, I'll be performing tonight with um, Eric M. So I hope you guys could come by and see it. But so, you know, what does turntable music bring to electronic computer music, all this interface stuff? I think one thing is that it's, you know, the virtuosity that turntable music, especially hip hop turntables, with, with that, um, that pursuit is, uh, is quite extreme. And it's something maybe that could be applied to, um, you know, um, to other forms of computer music. And it is kind of happening. There's this whole scene called controllerism of these guys taking MIDI controllers and really trying to, they modify it and they really try to be virtuosic in 
playing their Oxygen 8 keyboard <laughs> um, in sort of a turntablist manner. And also, I guess, this kind of notion of expressively playing back samples and sounds. You know, how can you play back a, a pre-recorded material, but sort of physically and um, with um, expression? Um, all this equipment, um, especially DJ equipment, the, the great advantage it has is, like I said, they're extremely sturdy and durable. If you look at MIDI controllers, they're pretty um, flimsy. Um, and you know, faders, for example, DJ faders have developed over the years where they're extremely smooth and fast. So if you're designing a, a control box, you know, you could buy these faders. They're not cheap, but you could get these very high quality faders that you know, are, are built to last. And uh, it brings circular uh, rotating interfaces. Um, you know, what can we do with this circular interface? How to, how to map it? What kind of mappings can we do? Um, what's unique to this? What, what can um, computer musicians take from, from this rotating uh, metaphor of playing a sample um, back? I think those things will be, be coming up more as the turntables get more involved with, uh, with mapping and <coughs> building their own tools. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my very rough overview and um, of my presentation. But I'd be happy to answer any questions or any thoughts. Um, I was wondering about how you how you might make your solo set. You told me before that that is basically centered around like the order of records you, you select beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, do you actually go back in? During the set, do you go back to a record you've already played before, or is it really like a going forward to like a stack of records? Um, I guess I'm more structured in the yeah. idea of stepping through the records. Yeah, most of the time I'm stepping through records, um, but I have sometimes played the records back again. I guess that, that aspect comes really from DJing, um, mm -hmm. where like, if you think of a DJ composition, you, have, you go, it's a kind of a progression. Yeah. But then there's a certain technique of bringing back what you played before. Um, and so that, that kind of adds another yeah. structure. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, but I don't really do it too much. Okay. And um, I guess, yeah, a lot of preparation goes into which records to use yeah. and then which to bring to the venue. But then the execution of it is, is kind of in Um, linking into that, that uh, what do you think about things like the, the database and tracks? So, so you, you can organize, uh, say, a solo. So you know what tracks, but you also know you've got everything else that you could ever want there. And you, you can access that if you spend the time tagging everything quite quickly. Do you think that's a you know, Is that something you're interested in? Is it possible to think the speed? Yeah. yeah, I think. Um, it would be interesting if there was sort of a, um, yeah, automated tagging based on certain quality. So it does take quite a lot of time to rebuild up a yeah. record collection. You can navigate mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah, I mean, what I'm interested in, in my setups, I don't use any pre-recorded samples. Everything mm -hmm. is sampled from the turntable. And you say physical records, you don't? Yeah, so I only take, so my current setup, I don't use any digital files that are already in my computer, but everything, mm -hmm. all the source comes from the turntable. That's just a decision I made because um, it's easier for me to, to work if I set these rules. But I would like to have a system that would start tagging or analyzing the samples that I record into my computer and categorize it for me so that when, if I want to bring it back, I could say, I wouldn't have to look it up, but I already know that it's in this uh, area. assigned yeah, yeah, to this area. I think in a more broader sense, this whole tagging thing is, is is a big issue for everybody. Like everybody has 40 gigs of music, and you probably haven't listened to all of them. And suddenly, you could you could download a whole collection of artists' music, whereas before you were you know looking, choosing on which album for them to buy. So there's more of this in investment into the selection process. And I think um, with this whole digital systems, there's going to be more technology. Of, well, there already is, but how to sort your music or maybe services of people already sorting music for you. Um, do, you do you see, when you talk about the community aspect of uh, DJing, 
um, see perhaps something developing in uh, Paradox, what's happened with iTunes with the Genius feature, where they take everyone's personal data and mangle it together to make links between tracks that walk go well next to each other. Do you ever see uh, turntablists coming together, sort of sharing uh, details about their sets that then other people are saying, well, you know, they're mixing a lot like this if I want to sound like that. You know what I mean? But yeah, I mean, it's already happening, I think. Um, DJs and turntablists are already sharing their um, their Serata Live libraries at gigs. They, sw they swap their hard drives, mm -hmm. swapping all the data, and um, people making uh, battle records, digital battle records, mm -hmm. um, sharing that stuff. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, it will happen more. You <coughs> briefly held up your, your reinvention of a USB controller, mm -hmm. and then you put it down again. Actually went into what it's controlling, mm. and I'm really, really curious about it. Well, the um, when I when I designed this controller, um, it was sort of I didn't really have a specific um, function or things that I wanted to built into it. So I just kind of designed it so it fit my right hand and would have sort of the controls that I might need. So you know, I I, I built in a 360 degree. Um, potentiometer, uh, a hat switch uh, for direction, joystick, um, fader, a knob here, a switch, and then two foot pedals. And then this is the trigger from the fader. Mm -hmm. um, most of the thing is, is just this, this connecting the fader to this box that goes to the computer. Uh, the wheel changes pitch of the sample. Um, it's a, these 360... What? Well, you could scratch, I you could. Could scratch through the record the sample. Yeah, I could, but this sensor, um, the 360 pot, is a really um, noisy. If I really wanted to do accurate sketching, I'd probably use an optical encoder. Um, and I don't know, I, I kind of went back and forth because I don't know if I really want to scratch digital files so much because my setup is based on something I could already scratch. So I, I just kind of do a very um, computerish pitch shifting with this, where I do kind of a stuttering sound with this. But I don't really map it. I, I, try not, I try to avoid a bit of the simulation part. Um, yeah, the joystick does more kind of different kind of pitch shifting. The foot pedals, um, one is to record into another sample buffer. The fader is, um, actually when I'm recording, um, the, the crossfader is actually recording into four buffers. And then those buffers are playing sequentially. And I could change the order of, of how they play or which one I, I decide to record into. Um, so the fader and the foot pedal control. But, um, yeah. So when you in you know, an acoustic uh, electronic uh, context, that uh, and as an acoustic player myself, I find uh, that what I'm often seeing lacking that the digital uh, domain has is not expression. There's a lot of expression of articulation. Mm -hmm. By this, I definitely mean the ways of articulating the sounds that were played by the electronics. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is that something that you're interested in, or do you see any need for developing that? Yeah, no, I definitely use different parts of the, of the mixer or different vinyls when I play with other people. Um, dynamics is, is very important. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting all the things you discover when you start playing with other uh, 
acoustic instruments. Um, and I mean, most of the context I played has, has been in sort of a free improvisational uh, context. So it's, yeah, there hasn't been any kind of compositional settings. But no, I, I do think about these things. It really, the, the solo aspect. But, but what I think is that actually I, I try to do as much solo because I feel like the solo performances also build a foundation for me for the articulation when I play with other people. If I don't have my chops, if I don't have my skills that I could rely on in a solo performance, then in, in a collaborative environment, I don't really have anything to fall upon or to, to keep as a basis. Um, and the solo environment really forces me to, to show what I have. I just want to be also in terms of the electronic world. So, I mean, how do we do that? How do we articulate? Yeah. You know, this is but the expression part has been so short to death in the last 15 years in terms of the digital uh, and the domain. So everybody is expressive or is not. I think yeah. it's more personal more than a, a technical uh, need these days. But I wonder how do we articulate. Yeah, I think um, I mean, when this discussion came out in the first day, I think, but the aspect of risk is kind of important for me. Because um, okay. my setup, my solo setup is very um, uh, risky in a way that it could be easily become boring. I'm always forcing myself to be on and making sure that things are developing and being aware. And I never have a system that really um, helps me out in a way. And I don't know, maybe if computer musicians have this aspect of more of a, of a blank sheet when they go on stage, maybe that helps them? I don't know. I also think the question was, if I can, mm -hmm. the, the question and I would phrase really generally, if you would reverse it and ask how do we articulate in acoustical music? And that's very obviously a very weird question because it clearly depends on the instrument. Because articulation on, say, like a standard bass is very different from a piano or a flute. And so I would say that the articulation, especially in, in, in dynamic sessions, is really important, but I don't think we can say anything generalized about it for electronic music because it will depend on the type of instrument being played and the way it's being played. Yeah. Because if you would have somebody who would play the piano without any dynamics, which I suppose you could with, with some training, that it would get very, very annoying mm -hmm. in, in an ensemble context as well. Well, just so it, I think it's up to an individual performer and, and uh, maybe instrument designer. Okay. Do you want to say anything generalized? Uh, about the mm -hmm. Well, I think the question should be asked. Yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. that's why I'm asking in some ways. Because, I mean, the, the example of the piano uh, you know, being played without mm -hmm. okay, articulation in a way, or a speaker, if you want to generalize the question, mm -hmm. listening to a speaker that speaks very, very beautifully, mm -hmm. interesting topics in a very monotonous mm -hmm. way, you would forget what the person said and start to listen to the video. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just saying, I think it's an important question to ask. Yeah. 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 Maybe one more question, and then we'll move on. I, I was interested in the, I mean, I like the history you gave. I've often heard that kind of told by other musicologists in various ways and show the kind of conflict, both like racial and kind of economic and social, between what's perceived of as kind of poor hip hop community and the kind of, the kind of upper crust art world, Christian or play, mm -hmm. you know, dialogue. And I'm curious if you, because I'm, and in my perspective, it's always been that it seems like it's, it could be complementary. That's the, could be a point of kind of convergence for those two communities as opposed to a, to a dialogic one, but mm -hmm. do you feel like the digital tools are maybe helping that, hurting that? Does it exist? It's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's, it really brings it into a larger issue of, well, digital technology, it's kind of the whole digital divide fantasy, right? When all this stuff came out, it was this great thing that would liberate everybody around the world. But that didn't really happen. <laughs> it's not like everybody could have their two gigahertz laptop to play Serato Scratch. Um, so I think there's potential, but in reality, it 
it's not really helping so much. But I don't know, like if you look at, I mean, what I'm interested in is in how the, the non-technical appropriation of technology, and that's basically what hip hop is. Um, it's about looking at technology that's old or mundane and using it or flipping it for their creative use. Um, that could probably be said to mark with as well. But so if you give them these tools or you know, see what they could do with it with accessible technology, then there's great potential for this creative force. Um, so that there is no digital divide and misuse? No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and, and all the, I don't know, I, I, I can't really say so much. I can't really talk for other communities or other um, economical um, uh, social groups. But I do see that, you know, for example, kids in New York or you know, other communities are fully aware of what's out there. You know, they know about Serato, they know about what you could do with digital files. All these kids are playing with MP3s, they're sharing stuff. And that's, I think that's helping. I mean, it's great that every, everybody has this access to music. Okay, then uh, we'll take a short break and then we'll come back with uh, the topic.